That is indeed an energetic way to begin worship, isn't it? It's good to welcome you this morning as we worship. Those of you who are, who are here in the sanctuary and those of you who are continuing to worship at home via live stream, it's good to, good to be here with you today as we uh, celebrate this Lord's Day. It's good to, uh, to be in each other's company. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able and we'll join together in this morning's welcome and call to worship as printed in this morning's bulletin, or you can follow along on the screen. The Holy One, defender of the poor and needy, calls us to gather now. We come thankful to be a part of this family of faith. God knows us well and calls us by name. We hear our name and respond to God's call. The love of Christ urges us on. I'd like to ask you to remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, I Sing the Almighty Power of God. standing for the opening prayer. Let us pray. God of every thought and reality, the holy prophetic sustainer of community, we gather here today as your people, children of the good news. Assure us of your presence once again, that we may trust the mystery of life and growth as we gather in the name of our Savior, who is Jesus the Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask you to remain standing for a moment. We're going to try a little experiment here. Uh, Barry Simich suggested last week after service, and I didn't get this in the bulletin, but that we uh, begin to try to do a, a sort of a revised version of the passing of peace. So what I'd like to do is pass the peace this morning, but you can't move around. So, <laughs> so just uh, make eye contact with people, exchange signs of God's peace. So we'll, we'll try that and see how this is satisfying for you. So the peace of Christ be with you. <laughs> That's right. Live, we should do like live long and prosper. <laughs>
We'll see how that progresses. <laughs> it's a work in progress. The whole, whole thing is. So uh, this morning, <clears throat> I just want to take a moment, moment to uh, remind you of some of the missional opportunities uh, before us. As I usually do, I'd like to invite you to turn to the blue section of the, the bulletin today, which has uh, a number of uh, upcoming activities. We have a number of children uh, activities, our 4th of July uh, parade where children and parents can uh, ride on the parade. If you have interest in that, talk to uh, Mrs. Click about that. Uh, we're continuing our worship Wednesday on the lawn. Uh, hopefully we'll be a little more successful actually being out on the lawn. Our first two of, uh, we've, we've, what little cloud bursts we've had seem to be centered around Wednesday uh, evening. And then this week we'll have the worship at six and then a sort of picnic gathering afterwards. Uh, I am leading a group of people uh, doing a Wesley uh, in Ireland tour in October. If you'd like to be a part of that, please let me know. There are brochures in the entryway, and I'm having an informational meeting today at 3 if you'd like more information about that. We have several classes coming up, and Vacation Bible Camp will be July 19th through 23. While that uh, is a little more than a month away, they are collecting items, and you'll notice there's sort of a display and collection bins in the gathering area, and uh, so we'll want to uh, continue to uh, have collections for, for VBS, or VBC, however you want to describe that. Um, we have a couple of mission trips. We're, we're getting back to where we can actually go places again. So we have two mission trips coming up, one to Redbird Mission in uh, beginning the October 31st, and then one a mission trip to Guatemala, which will be in June 2022. Um, that seems a long way off, but we're actually having a planning meeting for the Mission Guatemala trip uh, tomorrow evening at 7. So if you'd like more information about that, you can contact Stephanie Cohen at scohen at stmarscarmel.org or uh, go to the website and get more information. During the month of June, our mission focus is Habitat for Humanity. A major barrier to breaking the cycle of poverty is home ownership. Owning a home is a significant means in helping provide a stable quality of life for low-income families and individuals. For some, though, decent, affordable home ownership is out of reach. Habitat brings people together to build homes, communities, and hope. They envision a world where everyone has a decent place to live. Please consider how you may help support this meaningful mission. So financial donations for Habitat may be given online, or by using the mission offering envelopes, and you can put those in the baskets at the back of the sanctuary. And that's true of your um, regular tithe and operational giving as well. You can put that in the basket as you leave, or go to stmarshcarmel.org slash give. Finally, I'd like to invite you to register your attendance this morning at stmarshcarmel.org slash attend. Uh, it's helpful for us to know that you're here, and there's also a field there if you have a prayer request or other, uh, any, any comments you'd like the pastors to be aware of or the staff, uh, there is a field there for that as well. All of these are ways that we continue to strive here at St. Mark's to make St. Mark's a place where a mission is a way of life. At this point, I'd like to invite us to a time of prayer. And so let us uh, bow our heads in prayer as we offer our prayers to God. Lord, our God, who created all things and promises us an eternal realm, hear our prayers of intercession, spoken and unspoken. We pray for peace. Eternal God, you sent us a Savior, Jesus Christ, to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace to the places where greed, pride, and anger turn nation against nation, race against race, church against church. We pray for the leaders of the church and nations. Mighty God, sovereign over all, give the leaders of the church and the leaders of nations the vision of your kingdom that they may lead us with justice and goodwill. We pray for the earth, God's creation. 
You made all things in your wisdom and love, O God. Grant us all a reverence for the earth that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. We pray for for those who are in pain in body and mind. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on those who are sick. Stand with those who sorrow. Show them hope by your word. Bring healing as a sign of your grace. Let us pray for friends and families. God of love, bless us and those we love, our friends and family, so that by drawing close to you, we may be drawn closer to each other. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who died for us and rose for us, who reminds us of your saving grace. And together we pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We do have uh, a couple of youth mission activities coming up, our work camp as well as Week of Hope. And one of the things we'd like to do this morning is to pray over those who will be going uh, on the work camp and Week of Hope trip. So I'd like to ask those youth and adults who will be uh, sharing in those activities, if you would please stand this morning. And they are mostly in uh, the back of the sanctuary. We have a few people in other places. And so I'd like for us to offer our prayers. We can't lay hands on them, but if you'd like to extend your arms toward them in either, either direction, uh, feel free to do that as we pray for them. Almighty God, we pray for this group of students and adults as they travel to be your ambassadors. We pray, O oh God, that you might give them safe travels that you might strengthen them for the work that you have for them, that you might help their witness to bear fruit of love and grace in the lives of the people whom they serve. We thank you, O God, for their uh, sense of call and purpose to these uh, mission trips, and we pray for your continued spiritual surrounding as they go in your name. And so we pray that you might bless them in Christ's name. Amen. So I know they will be sharing with us. You may be seated. I know they'll be sharing with us uh, after they return, and we look forward to hearing their stories. At this time, we'd like to share in this morning's epistle lesson. The epistle lesson comes from 2 Corinthians chapter... uh, First five chapters, 6 through 10 and 14 through 17. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, that there is a new creation, everything old has passed away. You see, everything has become new. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
This morning, you may have noticed uh, cupcakes and coffee out on the, the lawn. Uh, and that is in celebration of our 2021 graduates. And so we have a brief uh, slideshow this morning in which we'd like to honor our graduates. And you'll notice in your bulletin insert, there's a list of high school, college, and postgraduate um, folks. And so we just want to take a moment and we'll watch the slideshow and then I'll offer a prayer. So we've, we've had graduates at the other two services as well, but if you are a graduate and, and uh, if you would please stand for a moment, let us recognize you here this morning. So we have Caroline. Okay. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to offer just a, a prayer blessing for our graduates. Almighty God, we thank you for those who have completed part of their educational uh, life. And we pray that you might be with each person on our list and those who are not on our list, but are on our th uh, th in our thoughts and in our hearts. I pray that you might be with those who are finishing high school and moving into the next phase of their education or moving into the workforce, that you might uh, just give them a sense of our prayers and your presence as they move into this phase of their lives. I pray for those who have completed college degrees and advanced degrees and they're moving deeper into their vocational life. And I pray that they might find fulfillment in their work and that they might be able to express their best self and their faith in what they do and who they are. We give you thanks, O oh God, for these uh, young people who inspire us, encourage us, and give us hope. And so I pray once again that you, you might just bless them with your presence, give them uh, a life that is fulfilling and meaningful and that changes the world for the better as, as they move into uh, this next part of their lives. And so we pray for your blessing in Christ's name. Amen. 
I'd like to invite you to stand as we join together in this morning's uh, gospel lesson, which comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. This is a, a sort of a parable of Jesus as he's talking about growing things. Jesus also said the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make a nest in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So when I was a high school student and in youth group, we used to do what uh, youth groups tend to do now. We've, we've just finished uh, our spring retreat, and uh, the kids are now getting ready to, to go on work camp and, and some, uh, the Week of Hope uh, mission uh, trip activities. And oftentimes what we do with the retreats here at St. Mark's and what we did when I was uh, a kid is that our youth group had kind of a theme song had a song that sort of defined who we were and what our our mission was. As a matter of fact, my high school youth group had a a singing group then. We would sing together and we would go to other churches and sing. And our our group was called God's Creation. And that name came from the last sentence from the scripture from 2 Corinthians that David read earlier. Chapter 4, verse 17 from, or chapter 5, verse 17 from 2 Corinthians, which says, So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Jesus used that image a lot of a seed in the ground. And if you know about how things grow, in order for a seed to become a plant, the seed has to to disappear, to, to become something else that God intends it to be. Now, commentators on this passage have uh, reminded us that there are several ways that we can look at this parable, and that's, that's true of most of the parables. One possibility <coughs> is that the farmer stands for God, who is active in bringing the divine realm to fruition, even if this remains imperceptible to humans. Another possibility is that the sower represents a Christian disciple who goes about the work of evangelization, not always comprehending, but allowing God's action to bring it to fullness. A third possibility is that the sower represents Jesus. The seed that he scatters is the word. In its original setting, this could be a parable of reassurance that the, despite present appearances, his preaching will bear a good harvest. Now, there are, those are many angles, or at least three angles, that we can look at this uh, parable. And that's one of the really beauties of uh, Jesus' teaching in parables is that they can have multiple meanings. They're multivalent in the way that they can be interpreted. But today, I want to focus on the reality that, that Jesus is trying to encourage his disciples, whichever one of these uh, directions you might go, all of them remind us that God will be with them as they move forward in trying to bear fruit in Jesus' name. How many of you in the year 2020 had some plans that were disrupted or changed? Pretty much all of us. And in, uh, we could focus on the, the things that didn't happen the way that we wanted them to happen. 
And certainly there were many ways that that could be uh, true for us, trips that didn't happen, work that had to be changed, school that happened in a different manner, relationships that were, we weren't able to nurture because of, of distance. We, we, the list could go on and on. But one of the things that we affirm in 2020, and we continue to affirm into the future, is that whatever happens and whatever disruptions there are, God is still with us. We don't know when we plant a seed what will happen, but we know that, that God is in the fruit bearing of that seed. Now, I've shared a few times, and I will share once again, I'm not a plant person. I describe myself, Michelle is the plant person, and she likes to garden, and I describe myself as Michelle's gardener sous chef. You know, I, I, Michelle says, dig a hole here, I dig a hole there. There are, you know, things that, that I do to try to help that. But I am not the gardener myself. And, and I think that in some ways that puts me in good relationship with, with growing things for God because we are kind of God's gardener sous chefs when it comes to, to growing things. We are God's assistants. And whether or not those things bear fruit while we have... Uh, actions that we can bring to bear on that, ultimately they have to do with God. It's sort of like the weather. Every once in a while, uh, and this week is a great uh, case in point, uh, there was a lot of rain forecast. Rain didn't come, so Michelle was watering our plants. And every once in a while, somebody asked me, Pastor, what are you going to do about the weather? <laughs> no, true. This is the thing that happens to pastors. And... <laughs> And an old uh, pastor, retired pastor friend of mine said, you know, when people ask you that question, so this uh, gets asked enough that old retired pastors have sayings for it. He said, you know what you tell people when they ask you that question, pastor, what are you going to do about the weather? The answer is, that's a management decision. I'm in sales. <laughs> that's way above my pay grade or remit. God, there are certain things that we are in charge of, and there are certain things that God is in charge of. And Jesus, in this story about planting a seed, reminds us that we can plant the seed or we can help nurture the seeds, but the ultimate fruit of that, the, the growth in it, in many ways, is beyond our pay grade. That's, that's up to God. We have to, at some point, let things go and say, God, this is in your hands. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that we have no responsibility either. I mean, there, it's a balance there. Yesterday was our annual conference, and we had a new class of, of ordinance, people who were ordained for ministry. And one of the questions that uh, always gets asked at ordination, because this is one of the historic questions that John Wesley asked people who were ordained, and this question always gets a little bit of a, 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 a under the, the uh, voice snigger because the question is, are you moving on toward perfection? Now, how many of you are perfect? How many of you live with somebody that's perfect? I don't know why, but I always get more hands for that. Well, I hate to tell you, none of us are perfect, right? None of us are perfect. And, and for many of us, that question, are you moving on to perfection? We laugh because none of us are going to get there. But the question is not, are you perfect? The question is, are you moving on toward perfection? Are you continually striving to draw closer to the person that God wants you to be? Do you continue to grow in your faith and grow in the spirit of God? That's the question. And in many ways, that is the question that this parable addresses as well. We, we, the ultimate fruit is God's, but we still have a responsibility to grow as God's disciples. And part of that means we have to give God a certain amount of attention and commitment. 
I once uh, heard a story that actually happened a number of years ago, and you'll immediately recognize why. It happened before there were refrigerators, and people used ice houses to preserve their food. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever seen an ice house. Some of you may. Yeah, a few of you. So an ice house was a, a, a building that was very thick walls, had a very thick door that was sealed. And, and during the winter, you would cut ice, and you'd put it in the ice house. You'd cover it with sawdust, and then that, it would keep things cool. You could keep things cool in it. And I'm told that, uh, that the ice would stay cool even into the summer, that it, you know, if a, a well-built ice house would keep ice cool. So there was a, a man who was working, getting the ice and doing the work, and he was working with several other people. And during, during the activity of packing the ice in the ice house, he actually lost his watch in the sawdust. And he and his co-workers kind of looked for it for quite a while. They couldn't find it, and they had basically kind of given up. And so they were getting ready to close the ice house, and the little boy said, let me try. And he went in the ice house, he closed the door, and within five minutes he came out with this guy's watch. And the guy said, how did you do that? And the little boy said, it was easy. I went in the ice house, I closed the door, I lay down on the floor of the ice house, I closed my eyes, and I got very, very quiet. And after a few seconds of being very, very quiet, I could hear the ticking of your watch. And then it was easy to find it from there. Sometimes in order for us to see God in our, the, our lives around us, it means that we have to get very, very quiet. It may mean turning off the television and other electronic devices. It may be putting our books away or whatever activity uh, we engage in most often just to be quiet enough to hear God's voice directing us and instructing us. We also have to have a sense of unfinishedness to know that we are not complete. I have uh, been a part of mission trips several times in Mexico, Guatemala, Peru, so in Central and South America, and I'm, I'm told by people after the first two services that this is not unusual in other parts of the world as well, but one of the things I've experienced is that people often build buildings there by pouring uh, concrete and they use rebar, you know, bars to... to um, <clears throat> to reinforce the concrete. And a lot of times they will have a flat concrete roof as well, and rebar will be sticking up out of the buildings. Anybody experience that somewhere in the world? Yeah, that's, it, it happens in a number of places in the world. I'm, I'm told, and I don't want to take the edge off this story by admitting this, but I'm told that there is a tax benefit to that because if it's an unfinished building, it gets taxed at a lower rate. But I remember the first time that I saw one of these buildings, and we're going through town, and, and I don't mean one of these buildings, I mean lots of these buildings because they're in, in many uh, towns, uh, there are a number of them. And I thought, what in the world is going on? You know, why, why are these people not, you know, completing these buildings? And what is happening here? And what I learned is uh, that many times, if they build a first uh, single-story building and you leave the rebar there, the, the cement roof of the first floor then becomes the floor of the second story, and you, you use the rebar to, to tie the two floors together. And so uh, someone may build a single-story uh, building and then 10 years later put a second story on it, and they would still leave rebar because they're you know, thinking of another. And so in a lot of ways, that rebar represents hope and aspiration. It represents unfinishedness. And the idea that it's not quite complete yet, but they have hopes of adding on and being more complete. And as I've contemplated that reality, I think in many ways our lives are like that. Most of us are unfinished. Uh, uh, not complete, and we have a little rebar sticking out, and sometimes our our roughness uh, grazes up against somebody else's roughness, and and um, 
And sometimes conflict happens in that way. But we're better off when we recognize that we are an unfinished product roaming around with a whole host of other people who are also unfinished. And in that sense, we give each other a certain amount of grace and latitude. God reminds us that we are not finished, that we are growing, but we are not grown. We are not complete until that moment we are, when we are in God's presence in eternity. And so when we begin to look around at other people as not complete, we begin to offer them a little bit more grace. How we see other people often impacts how we treat other people. Let me give you a story example. A traveler, traveler was nearing a great city and he asked an old man seated by the road, he said, what are the people like in this city? The man replied, what were they like where you came from? And he said, a terrible lot, the traveler reported, mean, untrustworthy, detestable in all respects. Ah, said the old man, you will find them the same in the city ahead. Scarcely had the first traveler gone on his way when another stepped to inquire about the people in the city before him. Again, the old man asked about the people in the place, uh, the old man uh, asked about the uh, people in the place the traveler had just left. And the traveler said, they were fine people, honest, industrious, and generous to a fault. I was sorry to leave. And responded the wise old man, he says, so you will find them in the city ahead. What we look for is often what we find. And Jesus reminds us that we are all incomplete. We are all part of this creative activity of God. We are people in the making. And when we see each other that way, maybe we see each other a little more with God's eyes and God's grace. When I uh, first graduated from college, I taught elementary school music and junior high band, and then when I started working for churches for the, my first uh, three years in church work, I was director of music at a church, and part of my job was uh, children's choirs, which I enjoyed a great deal. And one of the songs I remember singing with my kids way back then was a book, was a song called God's Still Working On Me. And the course of it goes like this. God's still working on me to make me what I need to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient God must be because God's still working on me. Well, I tell you folks, God is still working on me and God is still working on you. And when we begin to, to see each other as people that God is still working on, then not only do we extend a, a higher level of love and grace toward one, each, uh, one another, but we also begin to nurture in each other that which God is growing in us. We begin to see the potential in one another. We begin to see the possibility in one another. And in that, together, we begin to grow into not only the individuals that God calls us to be, but the community of faith that we are called to be as well. So my message for you today is that you are God's creation, that we are made new in God's spirit, and that together we are being worked upon by this holy maker of this world in our universe. Together, God is still working on us. Let us pray. Almighty and holy God, you are working on us. And help us to see each other as people in the making. Not that we are perfect, but that we are growing. Not that we have arrived, but that we are moving toward our destination. And when we begin to see each other as people in the making, we begin to see with the eyes of God. We pray for your grace in our vision, in Christ's name, amen. So I shared with you about my youth group a little bit earlier, so we're gonna sing my youth group 
theme song for our closing hymn today, which is probably many of your youth group theme songs in the day, which is called Pass It On. Second Corinthians, for if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Go in the newness of God's spirit and love and grace. Amen.